Hi, I'm Brad Rex, the former vice president for Disney's Epcot theme park, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge podcast. Hi there, I'm Lee Cockrell. I'm the former executive vice president of Walt Disney World, and Mickey Mouse was my boss. And you're listening to the Coaster Challenge podcast. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. It's time to face your fears. Get that theme park therapy and let us both through. Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. Your fear can disappear. We know that theme park therapy can dry up all your tears. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? We accept because you know we're not average. You're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. A journey where people become fearful to fearless, all from riding roller coasters. So please, secure your hats and glasses, and keep your hands and arms inside the podcast. It's time to accept the coaster challenge with your hosts, Kim Dykes. Good evening, everyone. This is Kim, line producer of the Coaster Challenge podcast, and I am honored to welcome a special VIP guest. Andrew Locke, one of our executive producers, will be joining today's conversation as well. Today, we have the privilege of talking with our first park president and guest from the Six Flags Park. We are happy to welcome Jeffrey Siebert, a coaster enthusiast and park president of Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. Thank you for joining us and welcome, Jeffrey. Oh my gosh, absolutely my pleasure. So nice meeting all you guys and look forward to the fun conversations together. It's well, great having you, Jeff. We are all clear and out of here. I am so excited <laughs> and ready to get this interview rolling along. This is our first time talking to each other in person. I know about the role you currently have at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas, that you're an enthusiast and that you previously worked for Kings Island. Being a man of many accomplishments, we are so excited to hear the rest of your story. Will you please share a few things about yourself with our audience to get this interview rolling out of the station? <laughs> Absolutely. For those that I have not met, um, very similar to you, I've, I've known my entire life that I've enjoyed roller coasters, theme parks, the friendships that we've gathered over the years. The, the magical moments that, that we get to enjoy together and the true special nature of amusement parks and theme parks. Although we know the big hardware is what gets us excited, but it's really those friendships and the family connections that we've made really are what make theme parks and amusement parks special. It, it really, at the end of the day, it's by people, for people, about people. And we work so others can play. And there's no doubt that my lifelong passion has been taking care of our friends, our family, our fellow enthusiasts. And I've had the privilege of being able to do it at great world-class destinations. And it's been quite a fantastic journey. And no doubt for all of us, the best days are truly yet to come. Absolutely. And I can honestly share going through this whole journey as an enthusiast, just what you said. Each time I travel, I go different places, the world gets a little bit smaller. I see people that I know literally from everywhere. And then I meet people that become new friends and the circle just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, that's what keeps me coming back for more. I love roller coasters, but I have no problem standing in a line with friends. The time passes by in the blink of an eye, just, you know, with the positive energy that's shared amongst the community. So the first part of our interview, as Andrew was sharing with you previously, is what we call the fear journey. We are going to kind of take a ride back in time with your history as an enthusiast in riding coasters, your experience with amusement parks. And then the second half of the interview is going to focus more on Jeffrey, the man, the here and now, and things that you look forward to in the future. So the first question that we always like to ask as we begin the fear journey is what is the first coaster that you remember riding? 
Well, Annette, I have been racking my brain, Kim, since you sent the list of questions to try to remember what the heck my first coaster was. Yeah. It, it was one of three. My my hometown parks, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. So my hometown parks were Cedar Point, Geauga Lake, and we used to go to Conneaut Lake in Pennsylvania quite often. So it was either the Little Dipper at Conneaut Lake, the okay. Blue Streak, which is a classic, what well, was a classic, sadly, a classic wooden coaster at Conneaut Lake, or it was the Big Dipper at Geauga Lake. My family and I, because I've always just loved them, cannot recall mm. exa <laughs> exactly which one was first, but it was it was one of those three. And, and um, growing up with those rides and just riding them over and over again, but it was one of those three that was the first. If I were to guess, I would say just because we live closer to Geauga Lake, that it most mm -hmm. likely was the Big Dipper. Okay. And do you remember approximately how old you were when you started riding? I was a little guy. So um, by the time I was actually, well, I should say I was actually tall for my age. So, and I don't recall what the height restriction was on the Big Dipper at the time, but it seems like I was maybe six mm -hmm. years old when I got on the Big Dipper for the first time. Yeah. And having my dad hold me in with those great John Allen designed coaster trains and lap bars that <laughs> really did bring me before you were a little person. So I just remember my dad yeah. holding me in and my mom saying, make sure he doesn't fly out. Of course, but just uh, always loving it. That cracks me up because you always hear people talking about, you know, today's coasters and the airtime create they create and how they feel like they're going to fly out of their seat. And I, I have a sit down conversation with so many people with no, you know, that's actually not going to happen. I will say it sounds like you were a lucky little guy because when we went to Kings Island on that annual trip every year, my family, especially when I was little, they wouldn't hardly let me ride anything because they thought I was actually <laughs> going to fall out. <laughs> so courtesy of them, I missed this. I missed the uh, screaming demon and uh, the bat. Those were coasters. I didn't get to ride because they wouldn't let me, but thankfully I made up for lost time later on. Well, I was fortunate enough that my parents just loved amusement parks. So growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, they actually, their first apartment together after they got married was right across the street from Euclid Beach, which was a historic park, which had several John Miller coasters, flying turns, the thriller, really, you know, ahead of its time in many, many ways, but they would just go there and enjoy their time together. So for me growing up, I to have that level of DNA already where they just enjoyed it. Uh, it was fun growing up with Geauga Lake and SeaWorld of Ohio and Cedar Point. And so I just didn't know any different that uh, theme parks were not part of <laughs> just everyday childhood uh, for my friends. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. One of the things we hear about as enthusiasts or, you know, even just standing in a line for coasters, you always hear people talking about how scary is it, you know, people that are getting ready to ride for the first time, talking about different things that they're scared of, trying to face that fear and ride for the first time. Looking back on your history of riding coasters, what is the scariest coaster you remember? There's there's quite a few. There's no doubt. I remember the first time my dad and I traveled to Kings Island and we had heard, you know, for decades about the beast mm -hmm. and this beast roller coaster, or you got to ride the beast. And so uh, sun was setting and you just see those two lights on the top of lift one just kind of shining back on you so we boarded the beast for the first time and i remember again it was back in the day where it was just a single lap bar for two people and just holding on for dear life as you're roaring through the woods in complete darkness and you have no <laughs> idea where the ride is is headed next there's no doubt that was an early memory that was scary also the blue streak at Conneaut was just very intimidating for me for some reason. I remember my brother somewhat coercing me to, to get on it when we were still rather young to come and challenge the blue streak, probably because you really couldn't see a lot of it from anywhere. Mm -hmm. so that was also somewhat of a getting the bravery to get on and, and ride. I know the beast for me 
even as an adult, I didn't ride that for the first time. I don't remember how old I was, but I was older. And just like you're talking about with the blue streak, the fact that you really can't see that ride. You go up on top of the Alpha Tower, you can go everywhere, try to see what the coaster looks like, what what's that lies ahead of you. You really can't. No, and I would I would say that one of the other coasters that gave me lots of anxiety, I would describe it as positive anxiety, was in I believe it was 89 when Magnum opened mm-hmm. and it you know reaching over that 200 foot mark for the first time, just going up the hill and the way that the ride was designed where the hill looked like it could topple over at any minute and, <laughs> into my city. and it just kept going and going and going. And just, again, my parents, my mom screaming at my dad to hold her in place and to make sure that my brother and I are <laughs> going <laughs> to fly out, you know, after waiting for like an hour and a half or two hours to ride, just that anticipation and, and that shared experience of you just see the lake rising and the wind starts picking up and you can't see where the drop is. And then you, go down that first drop and the second drop has that turn to the left that just kind of catches you by surprise. And no doubt Magnum, but I also say it's probably one of those rides that definitely gave me more anxiety. It was still positive anxiety. I was very excited to do it. Yeah. Um, but no doubt very nervous mm-hmm. and lots of suspense in, in the making. So, so Jeff, when you say positive anxiety, I think I know what you mean, but we've never had a guest use that term before. I think it's interesting I, I'm guessing what you mean by that is just excited, you know, t- to experience something for the first time, or is that what you mean by that? You're still very anxious. There's still lots of adrenaline and the unknown and the anticipation, but it was for a positive reason. Instead of worrying for something that would bring you down, I was very worried about something that is going to be enjoyable. So I use the term positive anxiety that still causes folks to be anxious, but in this specific case, for something that ultimately will be pleasurable and enjoyable. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's interesting you bring that up, Jeff. It's a really good point because I know exactly what you're talking about. I can kind of reflect on not just coasters, other things, just things I'm excited for. I love traveling, uh, looking forward to trips, you know, whether it be involves coasters or not. Uh, I'm also into technology and I'm kind of a gadget freak and you know iphones and a lot of apple products and other things you know new ones coming out and receiving them and you know it's exciting and it is it's 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 on the nerves but it's it's something to look forward to versus traditional anxiety negative anxiety is something that we dread because it just it it spirals us into just you know feeling awful so i'm glad you brought that up because i don't think we've had a guest before bring up that yeah it is we're still, you know, coaster enthusiasts, for example, coasters, once we conquer our fears, and we're going to be talking about you conquering fear right here, we go from having that negative anxiety to having positive anxiety where we seek out that positive anxiety. We want to get on the new coasters that are opening or or legendary coasters that we've heard about from friends that are their, their number one or their, some of the most unique experiences they've had. And we get, we, and it, and it, it can be a problem too at times, you know, getting that FOMO and, you know, fear of missing out and, you know, and figuring out expenses, how, how to get, you know, to Europe to ride these, you know, legendary coasters or Asia or whatever it may be. And, and it's something as enthusiasts, we have to kind of temper ourselves and have patience in those kind of situations. So again, that positive anxiety can still can potentially cause inadvertently cause problems, but thank you for bringing that up because we've never had someone point that out before my pleasure and and again even when you talk with our guests while they're waiting in line many of our guests experience just that positive anxiety they know they want to get on the ride but they're still nervous about maybe this is their first time going beyond vertical on a 95 degree drop and they know it's going to be fun but still they're somewhat nervous and anxious about you know how's it going to feel what is it going to feel like or zero g rolls or certain elements or other limiting factors that coasters have from a guest perception and perspective standpoint, but it, just waiting in that line, even for our most ardent thrill seekers, if there's something new that you have not physically experienced, it can still cause us to be anxious while we're just going back and forth, waiting to see what it's like for the first time. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, I totally get it. I, I've always referred that referred to that as nervous excitement. And you talking about that first, you know, 200 foot drop. Mine was Diamondback at Kings Island. And I felt exactly the same way, but that was the first time, you know, that nervous excitement for me, that's when I know I'm getting ready to get out of my comfort zone, but it's going to be a really good experience. You know, I'm nervous about it, but 
second time, like after I've done it, I want to do it again and again and again. And I almost <laughs> laughed out loud when you talked about your dad, you know, holding you all in the ride. It, it reminded me of the time my daughter hit the height requirement for um, the B&Ms. She hadn't ridden Diamondback yet at Kings Island, but yet when we were at Carowinds, she got on Fury. Fury was her very, very Fury. <laughs> she right. bypassed the hypers and was on was on a giga. We're going and, to get there. Yeah, the first time we went down that drop, there was no fear. She had her hands up, feet out. I literally reached my arm <laughs> across her, and she was yelling at me the whole ride, like, "Mom, why did you do that?" So. She had to. She had to train my anxiety a little bit to press the ride to keep her in <laughs> before I felt comfortable totally letting go. Great memories for sure. Absolutely, the, the picture of that first ride is priceless. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, looking back at the scary coasters you mentioned. What kind of feelings were you having when you approached the station of those rides? Well, in some ways, it was the anxiety and just the unknown, the fear of the unknown. And I go back to my memories of the blue streak at uh, Conneaut Lake, where you first enter by going through a tunnel. So you have no idea where you are headed, what is coming next. And then you finally get to the lift hill and you're in the woods and you still have no idea. So when I would see those stations in my early childhood. It was really, oh my God, I can't see this thing. I have no idea what it's going to do or where it's going to go. And then let alone when the invention of looping coasters came out during my childhood, how do you conquer that? How do we go on the double loop that mm. we've jumped around two times or the corkscrew or other early innovations? I mean, that was just crazy to start seeing where the coaster development was in the 70s. And I was fortunate enough to have a front row seat to all of it growing up in the 70s. That takes me back. You talk about those looping coasters. Oh, my goodness. The first time I saw Vortex at Kings Island, I was 18 years old, petrified, did not want to ride it. But at the same time, I didn't want to be the only one out of like 200 high school seniors that were there that night not <laughs> riding. So I decided to do it. And, you know, after I wrote it, I was like, wow, <laughs> what have I been missing out on all this time? That was actually fun. And then uh, looking at those inversions, Banshee, that was another beast, you know, just with those inversions and conquering that. And I, I had all the I had all the feels <laughs> looking at those that you just described. But for me, there was nothing better than that feeling of coming off those rides and wow, I just did it. I want to go do it again. How were you feeling when you got off of those scary coasters for the first time? Oh my gosh. Just, just as you described, Kim, I couldn't wait to do them again. And not only were they just so much fun, but some of those coasters that you mentioned, like Vortex, the ride is just, it was visually stunning. Mm -hmm. And the industry began to truly understand how to make coasters not only fun and thrilling, but to make them almost like pieces of art that you can actually begin to ride. And just the intimidation factor of how the vortex looked, you could see the entire thing. You saw those world's first six inversions back to back to back to back in the ride. Even if you didn't get on it, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing is cool looking. It's just a lot of fun, that striking orange and how it glowed at night and just the beautiful nature of it and the close proximity to the midway to the pretzel loops and just really visually stunning. But again, when I would get off these rides and, and we conquer each one individually with its own unique personality for, for many of us, including I'm sure the company I'm talking to, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to do it again. How quickly can I get back on? Yes. And for me too, it was just a matter of riding until all fear was gone. And I, I wanted to ride till I knew when I knew I revisited the park, I would just be able to get on it and it'd just be pure fun, no nerves involved. Yeah. Looking back at those early rides on those scary coasters we've discussed, would you say that it had any type of impacts directly on your life at that time or later on? It 
for me, it just reinforced the fact that this is this is what I knew I wanted to do. I used to pretend that my backyard was an amusement park. My friends all summer long had to get in my wagons and I'd push them up and down hills. We used to sit in coolers and pretend that there were log flumes. We put pieces of wood around my backyard and pretend that it was an old tent, an antique car style ride. Oh, wow. we, would, we would have, but just amusement parks help reinforce just looking at the joy of what it does for ourselves and the joy of what it does to people. I just always knew, Hey, you know, this, this is what I want to do. I want to, work in theme parks and amusement parks and help just bring joy to people every single day. And I'm lucky enough that, that that's what I've been able to do. That's fantastic. I love, I love how I've never heard of these ideas before. I mean, Jeff, I, you know what you made me think of, and you probably have seen that these videos, it's kind of a video of a video. It's a parent putting a kid in, in like a little box or something and, and showing a POV of a coaster on YouTube on a TV or something. You know, it's like you did like the uh, the pre YouTube version of that, you know, the low tech version of that with your backyard with those different things. I, I, that's fantastic. And in fact, I did hear it's um, enthusiast. I think actually he has a podcast himself uh, here in Florida. He's not really a close friend of mine or anything, but I, I know of him. And I heard during the pandemic, he was using his backyard uh, to, with his kids, you know, when the parks were closed here for a few months in Florida and doing like kind of simulating rides and stuff, kind of a similar thing. But I love the creativity that people have and, and you as a kid, you know, that that's fantastic. I love it. It was a fun childhood, no doubt. And I'm just fortunate enough that my parents kept supplying a never ending array of wagons because when you turn wagons into theme park rides, they didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <Just> sure. <laughs> First of the year that Cedar Point introduced the Demon Drop, the first generation intimate free fall, I thought, oh my gosh, it'd be great for me to dig this giant hole in my backyard and push my friends in the wagon down the hole. <laughs> that lasted about three, it lasted about three trips until it truly all the wheels just came off the wagon and broke. Oh and, my gosh. Oh my gosh. Did you, did you guys ever get hurt? Well, you know, that was part of the fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, fair it. enough. The parks, yeah. the real parks are a lot safer. Yeah, right. Thank right. goodness, my friend. Yes, we all, we all, you know, black and blue over the summer, but had a great time. And I'll say, right. listen to you share your story, just really hit a real strong nostalgic vibe with me. One of the joys of our childhood that as a school teacher, I see that has been lost with today's children is the, the, the beauty of pretend. And listening to that just if if you'd been my neighbor I would have been over there wanting to play and you know so many parents today they 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 want to protect their child from every single little thing getting hurt was part of it <laughs> you know learning from those mistakes learning how to get back up be resilient you know that was how we developed into yep fully functioning, successful, independent adults. And that's something that I feel that is really missing from a large part of today's young people. So one of my favorite things about, you know, roller coasters and amusement park and friends and Andrew and I have had some of these moments too, are those random crazy moments that just happen when you're not expecting it that just have you laughing to the point where you can't speak or you're just absolutely speechless and shocked of you know, what just occurred. Looking back on your coaster trips, your amusement park visits, your riding, what do you remember as being your craziest moment ever? I don't know if it's the craziest, but definitely one of my most favorite memories, especially recently, is my son and I were on a trip. We went to uh, SeaWorld Orlando. Okay. And it was a day that it was raining, not very crowded at all. And we decided we just wanted to get a few extra rides in Mako. Mm -hmm. So we started riding Mako and we didn't leave our seats. It was pouring down rain. And we, I kid you not, we did not leave those seats for more than three hours worth of consecutive rides. We stopped counting. And just <laughs> in the pouring rain. In, in the pouring rain. And we <laughs> loved every minute of it. Yeah. You thought we were both six years old, just truly belly laughing. But oh my gosh, what a beautiful piece of machinery. And just, 
it's just wonderful. I mean, literally, we did not leave our seats. Our legs were sprawled and fought. It was pouring rain, hitting those airtime moments over and over and over again. And just great memories. But, you know, where else can you do that type of experience and the physicality and the pure joy that it brings to everybody? Um, that That's definitely one. Uh, other trips are we, we love our friends at Universal Studios. So we make sure that we're, you know, we're with those folks that when I'm not here working, we're, we're playing in someone else's park. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I keep play clothes in my office. So it's not unusual. My family will actually come and meet me after work and we'll go ride rides <laughs> and play here or I'll go down the street to SeaWorld San Antonio or we'll go to Universal specifically Halloween Horror Nights and just we we just love it and to have those types of experiences and the pure joy that they bring and just seeing fellow enthusiasts when you're out there or running into other folks that we haven't seen in years just all reconvene on Disney or Universal Studios at a Six Flags Park at a Cedar Fair Park at our Merlin Park or our SeaWorld friends it's I mean, that's truly what makes it special. While the hardware does unite us and give us a common passion, it is those human experiences that are shared that really do make it all very special, meaningful, and memorable. Absolutely. I love it, it, Jeff. You know, yeah, thank you for, uh, by the way, for uh, representing Orlando there, my uh, new hometown that I've lived here now for uh, about five years. As I was telling you before we started recording, Jeff, I used to live in Southern California, and that is actually where I lived directly before uh most recently before moving to orlando and when i moved to orlando you know i was basically trying to improve the quality of my life california has its challenges traffic and cost of living but i wasn't just going to move someplace cheap or without traffic i I wanted to again have good quality of life so i needed parks and the beach and culture and i was looking and considering several areas but the one that matched those and met those requirements the best was orlando and in fact orlando really in my opinion, especially here in the U.S., is the only place that I could move to from where I lived in Southern California where I felt like I'm upgrading my theme park game. Because Southern California has a very strong theme park game, but Orlando, of course, is incredible. And, you know, I appreciate you, you, you you know, working at, you know, being there in Texas with a lot of great parks. You you enjoy going to Orlando. And, you know, I can relate to your story. You mentioned about Mako, uh, but I can top that, so to speak, not in a good way. Uh, so I had some uh, good, good close friends of mine, actually good friends of Kim and, and David as well from Ohio, uh, speaking of, visiting uh, last year, January 2022. And we went to SeaWorld one day and met up with a local friend of ours that also lives here in Orlando. And it was a cold day. It was January. And we get those cold days occasionally here in Florida even. And it was so cold that I believe the minimum operating temperature for Mako is around 47 degrees, 46 degrees. It wasn't quite that warm. It was like one or two degrees off. So we were sitting there and they started to do test runs on Mako and just kind of waiting, talking to each other, having a good time, being patient, waiting for it to open. It was already after park open and we're sitting there right in front of Mako. And finally, after an hour or two, it got warm enough, 47, 48 degrees, and they opened the coaster. Except it was also raining. Uh, it wasn't a heavy Florida rain. It was January, not the summer. But it was a steady steady drizzle, strong drizzle. I think you'd put it like a steady rain, light rain. And, you know, as fast as Mako goes, you know, what is it, 80-something miles an hour, 90? Uh, you know, that did not feel good, especially in the cold. You know, that stinging cold rain. Uh, I'm guessing what you experienced being in the summer, warmer months, at least the water's warmer so it doesn't sting as much but uh yeah well, it, was, it was a warm yeah. rain at least we didn't have the cold yeah. <laughs> when did. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there were times we couldn't open our eyes but we didn't care <laughs> yep yep, we could yep. Not see. We could. it's too much we're keep your eyes closed and just go for the ride yep yep that's right we kept our yeah at least i kept my eyes closed on those rides just to keep that stinging rain out of my eyes but yeah it's a unique experience it's a joking around with friends like you said i love that you by the way jeff i wanted to mention this earlier but i'll mention it now i love that you keep emphasizing the social aspect of this hobby and i'll give an example of this so one of my not my first but one of my strongest to this date uh, most intense examples of the social aspect of this hobby was the first time I went to Hollywood Nights, which was in 2021, which, by the way, was when I met Kim for the first time in person. And that was the infamous, quote unquote, year of Hollywood Nights where a lot of things went wrong. Thunderbird was closed the whole weekend. The tragic accident on the voyage that kept uh, the ride closed in the first night. 
and again, there were a lot of people, very shame, shameful people, um, some shameful people that were complaining on Twitter and, you know, not being respectful towards the, the, the woman that lost her life and, and, and a lot of bad stuff. But, you know, I was not thrilled. And David was there as well. And we weren't thrilled. It was our first time to Holiday World ever. But we understood someone just died. I mean, that's serious. They've got to make, you know, be respectful towards her and the safety of the ride. But quite frankly, Jeff, in the end, it was it was fine anyway for me, from my perspective. Because, yeah, I was enjoying the rides there, Legend, Raven, the beautiful park, Holiday World, you know, the, the food, everything was great. But most of all, I was just enjoying being around so many friends and meeting so many new friends like him that I didn't care that, that Voyage was closed. I was fine because of the social aspect. So I very much can relate to that, and I appreciate your emphasis on that. My pleasure. And listen to you talk about that rain ride took my brain back to the days of COVID when we had to wear the mask in the park. And uh, Orion, we got a tsunami, last train in the night, rain ride on Orion. With, and we had to wear the mask. Sorry about those crazy moments. It got the water all the way up my nose. I couldn't hardly breathe. We were laughing and laughing and laughing hysterically after that ride because it was literally laugh or cry we didn't know what else to say and I love how you talked about that you know when you're not at Fiesta Texas that you go play in other amusement parks I had the pleasure of visiting Six Flags Fiesta Texas last July for the first time and I just want to say I think personally some of the best parks have staff they go visit other parks. You all are doing an outstanding job. I thoroughly enjoyed every, every aspect of my visit and looking at the changes that are occurring rapidly with the park. I can't wait to go back. Well, that's very kind of you to say, Kim, and, and no doubt those Great water rides that we just described on, on coaster experiences with rain. It's like riding a washing machine. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're, 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 you're coming off soap, but uh, uh, great fun times, great, great memories. And, and not only that, I had when I worked at Kings Island, my favorite memories at the park are different seasons with the beast. Mm -hmm. The beast's personality in the rain is phenomenal, specifically in the day where it was still running skid breaks. Yeah. The personality and just the unleashed nature of what that ride wanted to do with those skid breaks. But my favorite memories ever of the beast are when it would snow and the snow would go flying off the front of the train like a snow plow. Oh, wow. And then in the fall, if wow. you have not, you've not ridden the beast in the autumn, when the leaves are in full color. Yes. It's just absolutely breathtakingly stunning where all these colored leaves are just flying off the tracks, mm -hmm. reds, yellows, oranges. It is just, it's breathtaking. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And to know the history of the beast and the unique nature of that ride just really makes it that much more special. Oh, Riding yeah. it in the snow sounds oh my absolutely God. fantastic. It was a day, yeah. where it was in October, and we had a strange just kind of mini blizzard and the park only stayed open until noon. So we all ran from the office to the beast to get, <laughs> wow. get right because it was uh -huh. kind of like 35 degrees. So we all ran to the beast and it was just phenomenal. So, so Jeff, you, you know, the snow rides you're talking about, I'm fascinated. So this wasn't something that guests really ever got to experience because, you know, y y the park would wind up closing for the snow and that like you just described, right? That's correct. Where most guests didn't have that opportunity, but the park decided it was, we opened at 10. Oh my gosh, it's snowing so much. No one is here. The snow is actually getting worse and the snowstorm was actually worse than they predicted. So we ended up saying that we're closing at noon, but it didn't stop all of us. I mean, we truly emptied the office <laughs> just so we all can hop on <laughs> and get a, a very rare snow ride on the beast. That's a great credit right there. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Snow credits on the beast. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> so as enthusiasts, a lot of the conversations we have, you know, are about coaster rankings, what coasters we like the best, what coasters we don't like so much. Some people rank coasters, some people don't. 
Uh, looking back on your coaster experience, what would you say is your absolute favorite coaster you've ridden so far? No doubt the Beast at Night ranks as just favorite for so many different reasons. One, just because I had the luxury of, you know, test riding. That's one of the other advantages of working in the industry is you can test ride whenever you really need to. So I would do quite a few test rides, find an empty seat specifically towards the back of the Beast at Night when I was working and, and mm -hmm. hop on a few rides. And the Beast personality is truly unlike any almost any other ride on planet earth. I mean, how many rides do you know were designed to sprawl over 35 acres of land? How many rides do you know follow just the topography of the land were built by a gentleman that, owned, that designed one and only one wood coaster in his entire career? I mean, it, and just riding the beast through its different personalities when the moon is full or mm -hmm. it's dark, the, the yeah. nighttime rides on the beast just to this day are spectacular. And the fact that I was able to, now enjoy that with my kids again, get their reaction to the beast at night and watch other folks ride the beast at night. It's, it's a true rite of passage, but no doubt some of my favorite memories just ever are sharing my time with the beast. And, you know, that's one thing that I talk about with friends and other enthusiasts and that sort of thing, whether you value the beast for its thrill, you know, some people say it doesn't have airtime or whatever. There is no experience that even comes close to what you just described and going through all of the seasons and even a night ride. One night ride is not going to be like another, you know, depending on the moon. What, how much light you get. It's different every single time. And um, each each time, it's just like a new ride for me. It It is an amazing masterpiece of engineering at a time that everything had to be done mm -hmm. by hand, yeah, manual no calculations, working yeah. around trees, working around the foliage. I mean, it, 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 it's to this day, it's still just a mind boggling masterpiece of how well it is held up. And the fact that the ride truly wants to be unleashed. The fact that <laughs> throughout its course, it drops more than 212 feet in elevation and just keeps, it just wants to roar. And right. just that unique beast shake of where it's going over those final approaches before a lift too. It just has its own distinctive feel to it. And there's so many folks in the industry that the beast is a commonality for the fact that it's run its PTC trains and the involvement with Tom Rebbe and PTC and Al Collins, Jeff Graham key. I mean, the ride just has a very special place in history. To your point, it does not necessarily have some of the attributes that we all love specifically airtime, but it more than makes up for it in its unique nature. And those nighttime rides where it just roars through the woods in complete darkness. It, it's just really special. I'm going to remember what you said. It just wants to roar. Yeah, love I love that expression. Very, very thematic. So, Jeff, my first visit to Kings Island was in August of 2021, or excuse me, 2021, August of 2001, 20 years earlier. So, you know, over 20 years ago now. And I'm going to talk more about that later when the question I'll be asking you later on in the interview. But I want to reflect on the end of my visit, end of that one day that I spent that year. Uh, as you can imagine what I'm about to talk about, given what you just mentioned. And the friends I was with were uh, were ACERs, and I was an ACE member at the time. That was my first year being an ACE member. And we had had a great day at the park. We had ridden Beast during the day and everything else, all the other coasters and other rides. And it was getting, it was dark and it started raining. And one of the friends that I was with, one of the, it was all locals that were showing me around the park. One of the friends there, he explained, he's like, he says, it's nighttime. It's raining. We got to ride the beast. And we hadn't ridden it at night yet. And I was like, what? and I don't know if I'd ever ridden the coaster in the rain before. I don't know. I was an early, that was my early days as an enthusiast back then. So we very quickly, and if we walked or even ran over to the, the beast station and what I experienced that in those next 30 minutes or however long we waited in line and getting on the ride was probably my first experience first intense experience with so much 
energy, you know, emotional energy as an enthusiast, you know, the kinds of things we experience at say Hollywood nights, you know, and the station for voyage and things like that. That was my first experience. And it wasn't necessarily all enthusiasts there. It was just the general public. But one thing, one of the things I remember before even getting on the beast that night was, you know, so it's that station is all made out of wood. And the, the, the ride op, I think they had the microphones even back then. This is the Paramount days, of course. I think they, the ride op either was yelling out without a microphone or maybe had a microphone. I forget. It was a long time ago. But was kind of getting everyone all amped up and excited for the ride. And the guests in line there, they were all stamping their feet on the wood and making loud noises and just screaming out. And people coming back on the train, all excited. People leaving you know, as a train to part of the station, all excited. And just, again, I never had experienced that before. And, and, and again, it's now I experience and love about things like Hollywood nights and we get on the ride. And again, I kind of had to have my eyes closed here and there, but I did want to have them open. I did have them open a lot because I wanted to see this legendary night ride with no lights in the woods. There was no, there were no lights back then out in the woods there, like there are now to some degree. And just the rain, the slick track, the, the darkness it, it was incredible and it, it was a large reason why the beast was for many years and directly after that night uh in my top 10 list it, it took years for the beast to drop out of my top 10 it's an amazing ride especially when those two trains pass each other one going up the lift and one coming back into the station and just the dynamic of the interaction of guests clapping and applauding and just unbelievable Oh, yeah. All right. So now we're going to go from the top end of the pole down all the way down to the bottom end. You said the Beast is probably your favorite coaster of all time. Do you have any coasters that you would say are your absolute least favorite coasters, one and done type of deals? We love all of our children. As you know, they all offer unique things. But I would say one coaster that I'm not necessarily running to to ride again would be Indiana Jones at Disneyland Paris. Ah, uh, Temple de Peril. What was it, it that you disliked about that coaster? I've not gotten to ride that one. It, it, is, it is not enjoyable. In fact, it's the only ride in my entire existence with my wife that she said, please don't make us go on that again. Yeah, I have had, I have ridden that ride. I, I have, you know, the, as we call them flex credits these days or flexes. I'm one of my flexes. I'm very proud of Jeff is I've been to every single Disney park in the world. And I went to Disney Paris and Disney studios, Paris in 2009 or so. And I rode Indiana Jones in the temple du Peril, temple of peril as it translated in English. And I do not, did not like that ride. It was rough and yeah, it was not fun. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool looking. It's a great looking ride, but. Oh yeah. But the, but that park is magnificent. Indiana Jones aside, Disneyland Paris is, oh my gosh, there's numerous stunning attractions. And in fact, I would say by far, best big thunder mountain railroad yes. out there. the finale yes. of that ride is unbelievably phenomenal it's oh like, yeah oh it's my the best God, one it's just fantastic yeah Beautiful it's the ride. best big thunder yeah i agree out in the island there and yeah and, a, and yeah no it's a, it's a beautiful resort it's it's really it's it opened when it opened it was not well received by the french and it had its you know challenges early years but it has grown into a tremendous resort that's gotten great attention from Disney and from the, you know, the local owners there, uh, you know, in, in France and to the point that they're getting their own galaxy's edge and uh, you know, it, it, and other lands, I think they're getting a frozen land as well or frozen attraction. Uh, but you know, they're getting so much at that, so much love. And it's great to see that. Agreed. I just heard Andrew use that term flex credit. That's not anything I've actually heard before, but it actually, took my mind straight to <laughs> my worst coaster ever that I rode, I guess, as a flex credit. I don't know if you've heard of the John Ivers backyard coasters, Blue Flash and Blue 2. Yep. Yeah, I thought, this sounds like a great idea. If I can pull <laughs> this off, <laughs> it, it took me 
over six months back to arrange those rides on Blue Flash and Blue 2 that they were now up at uh, Haunted Hoochie in Columbus, Ohio. And that I finally got to ride those back in, uh, I think it was June or July of 2021. And Blue Flash, wow, I was literally told, ride at your own risk. I'm not charging you because we're not responsible. And <laughs> I just, I told him, I said, I need you to tell me, tell me how to ride. You know, tell me how to move. Tell me when to move. <laughs> I did it. And I did it right the first time. I did. He looked at me when I got off that thing. He said, you want to ride again? I said, no, I'm not tempting fate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, I now know what a flex credit is thanks Andrew all right so now we're going to look back on your journey not as much involving coaster specifically but as an enthusiast you know we all have that history that story that led us into the passion to pursue this hobby What's your story? How did you become an enthusiast and what coder, coaster specifically made you an enthusiast? Well, as I shared a little bit earlier, I, I think I was just born an enthusiast. I, I don't remember a time that I just did not absolutely love everything about it. From the earliest memories, again, playing with my, as I talked about playing in the backyard with my wagons and turning all of my Lego sets into log flumes and amusement park rides and every vacation that we could go on, sneak in an amusement park somewhere. But when I began to be able to travel and become more mobile and begin traveling outside of the Cleveland area, no doubt just solidified my love for parks. One standout experience is Kennywood. No doubt Kennywood is just truly a museum that happens to still be an amusement park that we all get to love on and enjoy today. I was so excited going to Kennywood. I kid you not. When I drove there, I was halfway headed to the gate. My brother had actually stopped me and say, you need to go turn off the car and shut the door. (laughs) Because I was like, we're here. I'm like, we're here. And the Steel Phantom, the original Steel Phantom was there. My brother was like, you need to go back because you left the door open and the car's running. (laughs) I just had to turn around and run back, grab the keys out of the car, turn it off, and shut the door and lock the door, but, and then just walking through those classic rides, Tumblebug, Noah's Ark, I mean, just truly phenomenal pieces of history that are still loved on and well-maintained to, to this day and age. And to be able to experience that was just really exciting. I loved it. And then the passion of finding smaller parks, besides the large parks, going to Waldemere and, and, talking with the Gormans and riding their classic rides and when Ravine Flyer opened and but their classic dark rides and walk through fun houses and just then getting that bug of how many parks can I go to and how quickly can we drive and how far apart are they and let's map it out. It just as you know, once you get bit by the bug, that's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. We yep. all truly yep. go on for the ride and and as you know, we're either enjoying a trip, planning a trip on our way to a trip or just coming back from a trip and then planning the next one. <clears throat> I yeah. kid you not, when I go home tonight, the messages I've been getting are get home because we're getting ready to book our next universal vacation. <laughs> so nice. Love hey, we're, we want to book it now. So we make sure we get, you know, good room rates and make sure we get when we want to go to Hollywood Horror Nights and let's get our tickets and which is fun. And that's, that's just one of many trips that we will plan ourselves this summer. But I try to make sure that at least we get home to Kings Island and we get home to Cedar Point and hit those parks that truly are just instrumental of my childhood and my upbringing, but getting to live all those again with my family and friends. So, Jeff, I, I got to ask you, you've mentioned Universal a couple times. And, you know, as I mentioned, I live in Orlando and actually I live and I'm, I'm not there right now. I'm elsewhere in Florida, but I my home, I am very fortunate. I, I you know, I. It's partly fortune and partly building in my career and, and working hard. I'm, I'm a big believer, work hard, play hard. It's one of the idioms I live my life by. But I'm very fortunate nonetheless. I live, you know, only five minutes from Universal. And Universal Orlando, and specifically, near, you know, narrowing it down, Islands of Adventure is my favorite park in the U.S., not the world. It's my second favorite overall in the world to Fantasia Land. 
but it, and, and being my favorite in the U.S., it's absolutely incredible. The beautiful as two to three of the best dark rides in the world, certainly two, uh, two to three of the best coasters in the world, two to three of the best water rides in the world, which, and again, with the theming and those three main classes of rides, having some of the absolute best of each, it's again, such a stacked park that to me is only second to Fantasia Land. And I just, I'm so lucky to have it as my home park. So I've got to ask you, I know obviously you love Universal. And I love that you love Horror Nights. I'm a huge fanatic as well. But I got to ask you, what is your take on Velocicoaster? Oh my gosh, I love it. I'm at currently 28 rides and counting. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. It is. It, it, again, the, the company is filled with amazing people. Universal, how they exited COVID. I mean, someday someone would do a case study just on uh, what we're seeing firsthand within the Universal system of parks, specifically what's happening um, with Epic. I mean, it's it's yes. just an amazing story within itself, and it's fun being a guest, but it's also fun knowing the great personalities and the great people that are there really working tirelessly to create the next innovations and magic from a destination standpoint. And as a fan, it's fun to you know borrow and lift and shift ideas throughout the entire industry and then bring them back home to entertain our guests. And that's what's yes. great with our industry is there's lots of best practices and ideas that are out there. We've just tried to assemble all the best ideas from around the world and then bring them home to Fiesta, Texas and within our parks and couple that with our own great innovations. It just really leads to a neat time within Six Flags as well. But also it's really fun to see what's going on at Universal. Yeah, that's a good point, Jeff. And if we, you know, like you said, a case study should be be done because if you, if you think about it, we don't have to go that far back. If we go back to the, the, the financial crisis, 2008, kind of that time period, uh, be, partly because of that financial crisis, because it, it hit travel hard and tourism. And amongst just, just lack of innovation in the time, Universal, their parks almost uh, got sold off. They almost went bankrupt. This is before Comcast. And then who would figure a cable company, you know, the evil cable company corporations, Comcast comes in and, and saves their bacon. But not only that, has the forethought, the vision, and the and the risk taking to invest, and then we get Potter just a couple of years later, and Potter transformed the not just Universal and saved their bacon, but the entire industry worldwide, and ushered in. I don't know if you want to call it the second golden age of parks, maybe the third, but certainly I would probably the second. And look at what's come the competition, you know, you know, you know, Disney with Avatar with Pandora and Star Wars and other parks. So you look at what you're doing, Fiesta Texas. We'll talk be more talk more about that later. The level of theming, I'm blown away, you know, that by I've not been there in the few I need to go back. I've not been there in six years, but I've seen the pictures and the videos and you know, even what it's, what Six Flags is doing, like you said. But you know, what Universal's done, and then like you said, how they handle the pandemic, not not getting into politics, but Universal versus Disney. I love Disney. I'm a Disney annual pass holder. I, like I said earlier, I've been to every Disney park on the planet. And I love going to Disney here in Florida. I go about once or twice a month. But I'm sorry, Universal, they're, they're, what they're doing, they handle the pandemic better. No reservation system. Look, they opened one of the best coasters in the world in the middle of the pandemic. They, they didn't halt that or slow that down, really. And, and I also have to say, and I, you'll appreciate this, Jeff, being a park president, and I'm sure you've noticed the same thing as great as Disney cast members are with their customer service and making the magic and all that universal Orlando team members are the best park employees in the world. I have been to universal so many times living in next to it in Florida. The customer service is second to none. I'm sorry. It's better than Disney. It's absolutely better than Disney. And just everything at that park, Kim, you know, you went there for the first time in, in 2021. Just, it, it, again, it's the best park in the U.S. It does so much so well. And I think, like you said, a case study should be done because it's not like it's had success for years. It nearly, we nearly lost Universal, you know, just a few years back. So, you know, thank you for mentioning that case study that it should be done. Someone will, and no doubt uh, Comcast will be the catalyst that has changed, as you said, the trajectory of not only Universal Studios and really sparking the innovation that we all love and see today, but also the entire industry. We've all benefited from a more powerful, exciting dynamic 
Universal Studios. It truly is the high tide lifts all ships. And that's what makes our yes. industry special is, is truly how it is all collaborative and, and creating and pushing each other to do better. And, you know, my job is to find those best practices from around the world and make Six Flags Fiesta Texas and Six Flags the best place it possibly can be for our guests and our innovation. And you put all that together and you end up with really fun, exciting, dynamic experiences. Because as you know, many of our guests will never get to a Universal Studios. Many of our guests will never get to a Disney. So to be able to offer higher quality premium experiences in their backyard really is what makes Six Flags on this new trajectory very special. And it's fun to see our guests take notice. That's awesome. I love it. And I want to thank you for sharing your insight on Kennywood. You were talking about trap planning all of your upcoming trips. As a school teacher, I do most, not all, of my traveling during the summer, you know, in addition to extended breaks that we get during school. And I'm actually visiting Kennywood for the first time this upcoming summer. So listening to your insight for that has me all the more <laughs> excited for, the, for that trip, hearing it from somebody that's been there, that's looking at it from more than just a coaster perspective. But from a historic perspective, I'm very curious as to what I'm going to see when I get there. Oh, Kim, you're going to love it. You are absolutely just going to love it. It is such a special place in history and in time and the love and care that they've given the park. It, I think you're, you're really going to enjoy it because it truly is a museum that happens to be filled with rides. It's, and it, it's just, it's amazing. You're, you're going to absolutely love it. Specifically rides that you can't get anywhere else. Fly, they're flying coaster that was just redone by premier rides okay. and the turtle. The last tumblebug ride of its kind and the Noah's Ark Funhouse where the whole ark is rocking back and forth while you enter through, you know, a whale's tongue and just other classics that are in the old Lost Kennywood section. Obviously, their unique collection of the racer, a classic John Miller ride, Jack Rabbit, Thunderbolt. I mean, wow. oh my gosh, it's it it you're gonna love it. That's all I can say is you're going to love it. Let's all go. I, it's a I, great park. I really want to go now because I'll tell you, I love my thrill-seeking, but nothing hits the heart better than these parks that are just a back through time. Yeah. Well, in the Thunderbolt, how, what ride do you know on that every hill you go on is bigger than the, than the last hill you were just on? That the oh, larger, that's amazing. The larger hill is at the end of the ride. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Oh, awesome. what a great hill it is. Yeah, what a great Talk about John Miller being ahead of his innovation, along with uh, the other folks that were involved in the restoration and the renovation of taking his original concept. The I think it was called the Pippin, if I'm not mistaken, taking his original Pippin coaster, which was, and then adding the helix middle element to it to create the Thunderbolt that we know today. I mean, just just fun, beautifully done, yeah. fun. The ravines, the ride experience, just pure magic at so many levels and here the ride is either i think it's a uh, close to 100 years old if i'm not mistaken by now or just past 100 years old wow that's <laughs> that's actually i think after listening to you talk gone to the top of my most anticipated new park visit of 2023 but there's so many great parks of pennsylvania if you have not gone through with hershey park Dorney yeah. Park. Yes, oh I've been gosh, there. Canobles. We could have the Canobles. same about Canobles. I've been to Canobles. Canobles. Yes. yes. And then, of course, Waldemere. Have you guys been to Waldemere? I'm going yeah. this year on that trip. Uh, I mean, Ravine cool. Flyer 2. Ravine Flyer 2 is a treasure, like a mini voyage. It is fantastic. And the scenery is beautiful again with Lake oh, Erie. Yeah. And their water parks are putting in a new water coaster this year, which is just looks like a barrel of fun. But their classic rides, their sky ride, their log flume that they have, just really fun, fun park. Yeah, Kim, make sure you do their uh, fun house. There, it's a ride through fun house. It is. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's yeah, so wacky shack. It's they have old a wacky school. shack in yeah. Pirates Cove. So they've got a classic walk through Pirates Cove. Mm -hmm. they had, I, I had to carry my kids through because they were somewhat scared and they didn't want their feet to touch the ground because it was somewhat scary inside. But the ride through Wacky Shack is oh, a so true good. classic as, as well. 
Well, that is something I'm now looking forward to even more than I was before talking with you. So thank you for that. So we've talked about your story now, you know, coming through time, riding coasters, the fact that you pretty much grew up as an enthusiast. Let's transition now to amusement parks. Tell me about your history in the amusement park industry, specifically what parks you've worked for and what roles you've had at those parks. Absolutely. Well, again, it begins with back in my day, there really wasn't a degree in theme parks or hospitality like you can get today. Enthusiasts are spoiled with having, you know, the University of Central Florida actually have hospitality and theme park degrees that feed into Universal Studios and Disney and SeaWorld yeah. or Bowling Green State University that, you know, partners with Cedar Fair. There was none of that. So I had to figure out what degree should I get to go into theme parks. And I was lucky enough to find at the University of Cincinnati that there was, uh, at the out of all places, the College Conservatory of Music that actually had professors that helped build and design theme parks. So my internships were actually with, my internship was with Jack Rouse and Associates that was designing theme parks and attractions for around the world. And in my internship, my first job was filing blueprints for Jack Rouse and Associates. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this looks so cool. The, this park that they just had finished opening in the early 90s. And look, there's a train that goes through a quarry wall. And wow, look at this roller coaster that actually blasts through a tunnel of the quarry wall. And this park just looks so cool. Little did I know, fast forward, you know, 20 some odd years that I'd actually be working for the park I was filing the blueprints for. But after working for Jack Rouse and Associates as their first intern, I applied for a position at Americana Amusement Park which before was known as Le Swordsville Lake. And I met with the owner, Joe Faginato. He interviewed me and said, I'm not letting you leave until you can accept a full-time job. So I'm probably one of those strange people that I never had a seasonal job in a theme park. I never worked just on a ride or an attraction or any of the more traditional path forward. I was hired by Americana as a full-time manager of marketing, right? While I was still in college. I worked for the company for several years. They were eventually sold to Coney Island. Uh, which still somewhat operates in the banks of the Ohio River. And then when I was working for Coney, I was actually recruited by Anaheim Sports that was bringing the Mighty Ducks to Cincinnati. And they were looking for someone that had more of an entertainment degree than sports because they wanted to broaden out the sports appeal with more of an entertainment appeal to widen their audience to come and enjoy the Mighty Ducks. So I worked for Anaheim Sports for the first three years. Uh, at that time, they we had the franchise, the Cincinnati Mighty Ducks, which I worked for, the Anaheim Angels, and the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. So it was a, just a fun time to see kind of inside the Disney magic and to see their level of expertise and how to really broaden appeal from an entertainment perspective. From there, I was then recruited by Paramount as they were doing some leadership changes at Kings Island in 1999, kind of in the heyday of the Paramount years. And Kings Island was ready to get through kind of an explosive period of growth and innovation and reinvestment in really more heavily themed rides and attractions. So I joined uh, in a supervisory role, then quickly became the manager of communications, overseeing all communications and guest experience for Kings Island. And when I was there, I was sitting on an IAPA board, the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. I was sitting on a communications committee with some folks at Schlitterbahn Water Parks. And little did I know that some folks were getting to retire from Schlitterbahn. So they uh, actively recruited me to move to the great state of Texas in 2005 and become their corporate communications director, eventually communications and marketing, overseeing all things Schlittastic and all things Schlitterific. So it was a fun ride as they were expanding <laughs> uh, their portfolio of parks on Galveston Island, New Braunfels, more hotel accommodations, going to Kansas City and working in other parks uh, really throughout the country. And then when I was there, some of my old friends that used to work for Paramount Parks were now uh, restructuring and reorganizing Six Flags. Six Flags was just coming out of bankruptcy, but they were looking for new leadership and expertise and really uh, the marketing director at Six Flags Fiesta Texas was retiring and they were looking for his replacement. So uh, they recruited me and I interviewed and came on over in 2012 
to Fiesta, Texas, and have had the absolute privilege of working with some of the most talented, crazy people on planet Earth in really shaping Fiesta, Texas for the greatness it was designed to be and watching our, our explosive growth and excitement and innovations and really then in leading the park and the team to uh, really fun new horizons uh, has been a lot of fun, which takes us to today as park president for Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. And um, you know, go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, wow, Jeff, I, I was already thinking of, of relating this uh, at this point in the interview, knowing that you had worked at Kings Island and of course working today as park president at Fiesta, Texas, but also adding on Schlitterbahn to that. I, I, I just, when I'm blown away by Jeff, and it, it seems like it's maybe more than just a coincidence, is Schlitterbahn is largely considered to be, by many, you know, water park enthusiasts, a lot of us, coaster enthusiasts, myself included, love water parks as well. And uh, Schlitterbahn is considered to be the best, if not one of the best. Uh, and it's actually two parks. The, the, the two parks there, New Brunsfels, and then there's the, like you mentioned, Galveston, but the two originals there in, in New Brunsfels outside of San Antonio, those are considered to be the the best water parks in the world. And they are fantastic. I, I had a great visit there in 2017. Kings Island is considered, you know, back in the Paramount days to be the best park in the chain. And I would say, and this is a little bit controversial because Cedar Fair, you know, Cedar Point, you know, that Cedar Point's kind of the crown jewel of, of, of the Cedar Fair chain. But I would make the claim that, Cedar, that, that Kings Island, even with Knox and Cedar Point, the Kings Island is perhaps the best park, if not certainly one of the top three and the best parks in the Cedar Fair chain, the giant Cedar Fair chain that is today. And then we have Fiesta, Texas. And again, it's not Magic Mountain or you know, Adventure doesn't have quite as many coasters. But like, likewise, Kings Island doesn't necessarily have the best coaster collection. But it's not just about the coasters. It's about the quality of the park, the park experience, the, the attention to detail, the cleanliness, the the, how the ride ops are, the quality, you know, the, the theming, et cetera. And I, and I know I'm not the only one that feels this way. Fiesta, Texas is the best park in the Six Flags chain. And I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you. I've felt that way for years and I know many enthusiasts feel that way. So here we have you having worked at all three of these top of the top parks, you know, one of the top set of water parks in the world. One of the top parks in the Paramount slash Cedar Fair chain. Well, you didn't work there at Cedar Fair, but it became part of Cedar Fair. And then here we have Fiesta, Texas. I mean, have you ever thought about that, Jeff, that that you've worked at, at the, the best parks in these chains? Well, I'm very humbled and fortunate to have had these collection of experiences, no doubt. And the way that I view what I do, really, at the end of the day, I'm a caretaker. And as you've mentioned, when I was at Kings Island and Schlitterbahn and now today at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas, my job. My whole point is that I'm a caretaker to make it better than we inherited it and to pay all of this information, legacy and information forward to our team every day so they can make it better than I could ever make it bigger. So my full <laughs> goal in life and as a leader is to just pay it forward and to make it great and to make it where we are just taking care of these experiences to make every day better, more exciting, more meaningful. And it's been fun to be able to do that at all these facilities, but also take the best learnings from these facilities and the other caretakers that are running these parks and being able to bring it to different levels um, for Six Flags Fiesta Texas. Yeah, I, lo I love the attitude. I love that. And again, it's that sort of that when you say it as a caretaker, that implies literally taking care in terms of being careful about how you do things but also taking care of that precious place, that park and the guest experience. And, and I think that shows with, with, you know, with the parks you've worked at and, and what you've done there. I mean, especially in the, this now highest role you've been in at Fiesta Texas as park president. You know, I, I have to tell you, Jeff, I, I cannot wait to go back there. You know, I've gotten my, my new credits to get there. I've not been on one <laughs> Woman, of course, Dr. Diabolical. Um, but, but also, you know, the, the, the your dark ride, the re refurbishment you did that recently, Again, I've not been there since 2017. So much has happened in six years that I'm looking forward to getting back there and seeing all the improvements and getting on the new rides, et cetera. Uh, and the only reason why I've not gone there is I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing a big road trip out to Texas. I'm just waiting for uh, our friends, uh, your friends not, not far off the road there at Coda Land yeah. to kind of get their acts together finally and get those, <laughs> those new ones. Because I, you know, I want to get it all together, you know, not just right. have to repeat trips. But anyways, but I, nonetheless, I'm excited to get back to your park and I, uh, hopefully next year. 
So that's great. Yeah, and Andrew, I almost narrowly missed Wonder Woman on my trip. I got one ride on it, and that was when it was cl- it closed. I think they had to read oh. the trains after that. Uh, so yeah. getting more rides on Wonder Woman is one reason I want to go back to park. It was also shortly before Dr. Diabolicals opened. Yeah. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm waiting until Podaland opens and has everything up running and fully operational to make that return trip. Plus it will give you guys down at Fiesta, Texas time to get the next upcoming ride up and operational oh, yeah. as well. Oh, is it new right. family racing Cinderella, I believe. Very exciting. That is correct. Yes. Kid Smash is Skyline. coming. Skyline. Yes. It looks like yes. a great coaster with the and now Jeff is by the way, just while we're talking about that, is the one of Fiesta Texas at your park gonna have the video feature, the video screen on the track? Oh, that's, that's correct. Wow. It's, it's called the Aurora nice. Light Package is the official yes. name. And both our installation and Six Flags Over Georgia will feature this brand new innovation, which are basically LED TV screens that are coupled together. Yeah. So on both sides of the track and the top will completely be fully animated all the wow. way around in both tracks. That's awesome. I saw that a demo of that at IAPA last year, and I was just blown away. And I, I, uh, I, I love that. I love that innovation. I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm a t- into technology. I cannot wait to see these rides at night. Be wild. Yeah, they're going to look great at, during the day, and they're going to look spectacular at night. And the fact that we can, because it's just full motion video, we can program it to do whatever we want for different times of the year, different oh. season, Halloween, Christmas, you name it. They'll give the rides its their own fun, unique personality for different times of the year. Nice. Now, you've kind of taken us on a walk through your history in amusement parks with the different roles you've had at different parks. And I love how you described yourself as pretty much the caretaker of Six Flags Fiesta Texas. With that being said, I know that there are many hats that you wear as park president. Will you please share with us some of the details of your current role as park president and what that entails? Believe it or not, it's actually rather simple at the end of the day. It's empowering the team to do good be kind and have fun. And the number one thing that I share with our team all the time, whatever it means is like, just make it great. That's, that's really the ask that our company has that we have is, Oh my gosh, with that, with whatever we do, just make it great. And it's giving them the tools and resources to do what they all know we, we can do and accomplish together. So really where I spend my time is just making sure that the team is set up for success because we know if our team is set up for success, then our guests are going to have an absolute blast and all of our shareholders, investors, and our company will also benefit greatly because our guests are having a blast. So it really is just making sure that the team is set up for success, having fun. And as you know, everything that's associated with running a city is ultimately what I do and responsible for on a daily basis. But the most important thing is truly just making sure that our team is really every single day set up for success. Well, I have to say your positive energy, it is contagious and it has spread like wildfire throughout your staff at Fiesta, Texas, because that was one of the big takeaways I had from my visit was literally every staff member I interacted with just really put off a vibe of being genuinely happy to be there. They they wanted to be there. They made it fun. They wanted to talk. They wanted to interact. And I can't wait to return. You're doing an outstanding job. Well, well, Kim, as you know, it's it's all about the team. I'm just very fortunate to work with very lovely people that when we are going through our hiring process of hiring 3,000 team members for the season, we use the term lovable stars. We we just want to hire lovable stars, which are people that know what they're doing. They're very competent, but they're just really good people. And we try to surround ourselves with just lovable stars because as you know, there's many days we see each other more than our own families. So if we're going to be all working together (laughs) in the rain and sleet and hot and cold, we're going to, my gosh, I want to make sure we're hanging around with, with really fun, lovely people. 
Absolutely. That's awesome, Jeff. Well, Jeff, we as we already kind of touched upon, you know, your your great success and you know your ability to to touch these parks in amazing positive ways didn't start with Fiesta Texas. It started much earlier. And I had kind of a personal connection to this that I, I want to share before I get into the next question and relate to the next question. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, for my first visit to Kings Island, which was in August of, of 2001, I had that great, you know, nighttime beast ride. And that was at the end of the day. But I want to take it, come back to the beginning of the day and then something that happened shortly after the beginning of the day. So first of all, let's put things in perspective. 2001, the new ride had opened that year, the now infamous Son of Beast. But of course, it had just opened and it was uh, working pretty well, at least when I was there, it was, thankfully. It got, I think, multiple rides on it. Still had the loop. And I remember something, and I want, maybe hopefully your memory is a little better than mine since you worked there, Jeff. But I remember having an experience that is very unique. And I, maybe I'm off the wall here. But as I mentioned earlier, I was with some friends that were all locals. And this is going back long before uh, Facebook and social media. This is in the days of roller coaster talk on Yahoo groups. And that's how I knew these guys. I'd never met them before. And this is the early days of social media kind of forums online. And, you know, there's a number of people we kind of talked in this group. And I mentioned I was going on this epic trip. And I'm one of my first enthusiast trips, you know, going to Cedar Point, Kings Island, going to Six Flags Worlds of Adventure for the first time, only time. And uh, again, I'm so excited for the trip, planning it. And these guys were helping me plan it. And they said, hey, we're all locals here at, you know, Mason and Kings Island. We want to meet you and take you out, make sure you have a great day at the park. And that was the first time ever experiencing something like that. And t- you mentioned paying it forward. I'm a big believer in paying it forward in life. I do that. I try to do that on a regular basis. And in a way, they taught me something that I cherish to this day, where since then, as I've grown as an enthusiast, Kim, she experienced this in 2021. I mentioned earlier, going to Universal for the first time. I love taking friends to a park for their first time and making sure they have the best day possible. Getting, you know, getting on all the rides they can and doing things in the right order and the tips and tricks and the shortcuts of how to get to places quicker and the, the best food and the best shows and everything. And that was the, the first experience I had of this was with these guys at Kings Island. And one of the things that they mentioned to me that I remember, but I want you to clarify, is we weren't there for an ACE event, but we were ACE members. And I seem to recall that we got ERT on Son of Beast. Does that sound right? That that the park offered that at the time in the morning on Saturdays, we I think? offered walkbacks. So every morning there was a ace paver on international street to the right that our ace friends would wait in the morning and then we would escort to basically your coaster of choice mostly it was to the beast but we would allow okay. our who was and then if the ride was open and ready early then you would basically have your own private ERT session because the the crew was there the ride was open the park wasn't quite open yet it wasn't quite 10 o'clock so it's like hey if you want to ride a few times where the park opens, just sit in your seat and enjoy. And that is a walk back that actually uh, dates back from Ms. Ruth Voss, who started that legendary communications and PR guru. Ruth actually started the walk back program uh, with the opening of the Beast back in 1979. And we had kept that tradition alive in her honor. And that is might be what you're talking about. That it was, yeah. it was morning. Yeah. Yes, that actually was my first time getting to do like a walk back a little behind the scenes tour. Uh, you're refreshing my memory now. That's right. And then yeah, the, the ride, what it was running, thankfully it was running in the morning there. And we got to have that those early morning rides, you know, and we, I remember we got to set, sit on the coaster and stay on it, which I'd never experienced that before uh, and be able to ride it, I think two or three times before the park opened. Yeah. That's right. Now, now you're kind of helping. Thank you for helping me connect the dots there. And that was a great, what a way to start at this legendary park. And, and, and by the way, and I'm going to continue down one more aspect of my experience that relates to you. But I got to say, my, that first visit to Kings Island, that park under Paramount was run so well that it took a long time, multiple visits and improvements that Cedar Fair themselves have made in their operation of the park, where it, it has gotten the point where now I feel like in my past couple of visits, Kings Island is back to its glory because I got to say nothing against Cedar Fair, but I made a visit there in 2017, you know, a few years after Cedar Fair took over Kings Island and it was a little rough around the edges, the operations and just the 
the environment. But they, again, Cedar Fair has poured the love into that park and it's gotten better, a lot better in the past six years. I, I, I go there at least once a year. Uh, but again, back in the Paramount days with you there and, and what you guys did with your team, what a treasure of that chain that that way was the jewel of that chain as far as I'm concerned. And related to you, uh, it was shortly after getting off Sun of Beast, maybe even the next thing, it was in the morning, it was early in the day. And again, I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday. Again, these guys being with these locals, it was like four of us total, so three locals and me. They were showing me around. They were so proud, and they should be, should be proud of a park like that, especially back then how it was run. And then they saw you, and they said, "Oh, there's Jeff." And you were walking around the park, as, I, as I'm guessing you did periodically. And they introduced me to you, and I get I don't expect you to remember me. <laughs> you probably met so many people over the years, but I remember you were so nice and so friendly and so positive, just like you've been here today. And I remember you were you were telling us a little bit about Tomb Raider because that had just been announced. And that you were excited about that coming in. And I never got to experience Tomb Raider, unfortunately, because I went from 01 to 2017, 16 years of not being into Kings Island. But I heard what an amazing, you know, has top spin and, you know, with the theming and everything. I wish could, I could have experienced it. Uh, but I remember how excited you were because, again, Paramount was innovating in such major ways akin to some of the things that we're seeing today with Universal, where, they were a, a movie studio that was taking an amusement park, but really turning it into more of a destination with highly themed rides. And while, unfortunately, Paramount, you know, they sold up the parks and, you know, Cedar Fair took over. And Cedar Fair is a little bit different in their direction. You know, nonetheless, like we talked about earlier, it's great to see what you're doing at Fiesta, Texas. I'm excited to get back on uh, on um, a poltergeist because, I, you know, I heard about the re-theme of that and the new queue and, you know, I've been on that ride, you know, and I've, and I've been on Flight of Fear, which is a steam ride indoors, but I'm excited to see the, the changes that have been made there. Again, all the steaming changes. But in any case, going back to Kings Island, can you talk about in what ways you contributed to Kings Island's success? And maybe some of those things I've talked about that I experienced during that first visit. And, and the second part to this question kind of related, um, can you talk about how your experience at Kings Island helped you in your role at Fiesta, Texas? Absolutely. What was fascinating with, with my time at Kings Island and kind of my own development was up until I worked there, I had believed that these parks basically had a life of their own. That specifically when you look at Kings Island, oh my gosh, it is so large, has such a vast, rich history that the park really takes care of itself in many ways. It drives its own destiny because the the critical mass of magnitude that it, it really does. So I quickly learned that it was exactly the opposite, that it was all about the people running the park, that parks mm -hmm. genuinely take on the personality and reflect the people that are running it. It truly is the adage, if you want to see how your team is performing or how your park looks, just stand in a mirror, because it really does take the entire team and our leadership personalities to make sure that, again, we're driving that culture of fun and innovation and taking care of our guests and taking care of each other. It's all the people behind the scenes that really make the magic come together. So that was the first time that I learned, oh my gosh, it really is about the team and it's about the people taking care of each other first and then taking care of our guests and taking care of the assets and shareholders and, and everything along the ride. That, that by far was, you know, an aha moment for me, which really has led to how I, personally have contributed and managed them when I worked for Schlitterbahn and making sure that, oh my gosh, at the end of the day, we need to create fantasy. It's my job. It, it doesn't matter, you know, what my car ride was like, or if the commute was awful, that, that is irrelevant. My job is now to love and take care of fellow human beings. So by gosh, I'm going to make sure that while we are here together with inside of our walls, that that's exactly what we're doing. We are creating fantasy, taking care of each other. As you know, as you guys shared earlier, life is hard. There's days that life absolutely sucks, not enjoyable, not fun, difficult, demanding, depressing, but not when we're together and not with inside our walls. Our greatest contribution to each other is taking care of each other. And that's really what I learned beginning at Kings Island, that it's mm -hmm. truly people, people first, everything else will work out. If you truly just take care of human beings, love on human beings, buy human beings for human beings, everything else will come with it. 
And that, that's the life lesson that I worked for working for Kings Island and then taking those learnings to Schlitterbahn and again here at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. That's great. And, you know, again, it's been 20 plus years, but I do remember aspects of many aspects of that day at Kings Island. I remember writing flyers for the very first time. And, and again, I know it's sort of against the rules, but snapping the cables back when you could. Which was oh, they're great. Experience. Oh, my gosh, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, no, oh my, and, and again, those three guys, they show me, Andrew, you're going to learn how to snap the cables, and I'm like, what, what, <laughs> what? snap the cables, because that makes it, you know, anyway, it was an amazing, and I snapped them, and, and you know, yeah, yeah, you can't do that anymore, except at Knobles, pretty much, which I did last summer, when I went there for the first time, I snapped the cables again, it was like, it was like being back at Kings Island 20 years before, but, but again, I just had a magical day, and yeah, I, I, I one of the things I remember about that day is the operations were great. And it, it just, it felt like, it felt so comfortable, but it felt like the people really were a big reason why it was different that day. I did, it was such a great customer service experience. You know, meeting you was, was one of that aspects, but many others as well. The La Rosa's Pizza, which is amazing, a absolute treasure for Kings Island, some of the best theme park pizza you'll ever have. And, you know, just it's, it's everything was just, it was such a magical day. And I really had never had a magical day, something like that, at a regional park. That was my first experience with that. And uh, so, and thank you for being part of that team and helping, you know, make those 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 days at Kings Island so, so great. And and again, I, again, another reason why I cannot wait to get to Fiesta Texas to see what how your touch has affected that park. And I, and I, I see it in the photos and the, you know the rides you've done and, and the the updates and the theming. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, you know, again, hopefully next summer. It's great. Well, we can't wait to see you as a guest. That is for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm a Six Flags pass holder. I've got my membership, so I'm happy. I'm happy to use it and come in the gates there. So. <laughs> and Jeffrey, wow, you really hit the nail on the head when it came to what leadership is all about. I told you previously when we were talking that I'm a school teacher. I've been teaching now for 24 years and the work I do isn't easy. I'm in an inner city school, very high at risk student population, lots of trauma within the student population. And a lot of the schools in our area are not succeeding When I started at my school, I've been there at this particular school now for 19 years. It was one of those schools that wasn't succeeding either. I mean, and honestly, it wasn't safe for students. It wasn't safe for adults. It was, you know, just a scary situation all the way around. And I've been a part of a team that has stayed the course and We've made our school a destination school, you know, where there's a waiting list. And we don't have a different student population now. There's no certain sort of application process that's different, you know, from the rest of the public schools and Jefferson County public schools. It's an equal playing field. So, you know, when our superintendent comes to visit out of the 95 elementary schools in our district, you know, it's like, What makes this school different? It is the leader, (laughs) the principal. No matter how hard the job is, you know, she's there with us. She's not looking down on us behind a desk. You know, she's in there with us. She's building everybody up. And I mean, it, it just, it gives you that I can do attitude and Yes, it's work, but it's work that's worth doing because she has created an environment where it's not hard work. We call it heart work. It's work from the heart. We have a passion for that we want to do and what challenges the day brings. We've got it because it's it's everybody together. There's no I and team. Yeah. So it's without question that you created a fantastic work environment for your staff at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. 
it's also, you know, flowed right down into the guest experience. What overall do you feel has been your greatest accomplishment at Six Flags Fiesta Texas? Is that it or is there more? My greatest accomplishment is really the friendship with our team and guests. Uh, just like you guys described, when I'm out in the park, it's it's interacting with our guests. It's that one-on-one communication. It's the never-ending true philosophical belief that tomorrow will be better than today. And the driving force to constantly strive to do that. It's it. It can be exhausting, but at the same time, it's wonderfully exhausting. And the team knows that not only we assess where we are today, but more importantly, where should we be? But even more importantly than that, where could we be? And it's keeping us all focused on where could we be has led to the dramatic improvements and change and look and feel of Six Flags Fiesta Texas. Like many parks around the country, the park was built with vision and beauty. And now as the the top cheerleader and caretaker of Six Flags Fiesta Texas, it's truly my job to make the park a showpiece, a pure desirable delight for our team and our guests. And when you're able to surprise even our own team with the level of improvements and the quality of the paint, the artistic nature of what we do, the quality of building rides and attractions, the theming, the storytelling, great entertainment, nighttime fireworks show spectaculars that no other regional theme park on planet Earth can achieve. That's what makes it exciting. The fact that we're able to push the envelope for a great cause, which is the pure enjoyment of humanity. And to stand there and watch our fireworks show and hear a collective gasp of pure enjoyment, there's nothing more satisfying or rewarding than knowing when we go home at night that we're taking care of each other. And at the end of the day, that will always be my greatest joy and hopefully my greatest gift back to our team and our guests is just the pure passion to take care of each other and to do it in the best way we know how possible. Well, and there's no doubt from listening to your responses to my questions, you know, the, the, the passion that you have for the impact that you're having on your team on the guests that enter your park day in and day out. On the flip side of the coin, what impacts would you say have working in the amusement park industry had on your own life? Well, kind of like our conversation <laughs> right now, it is it is a lifestyle. Our hours are not nine to five. Our hours can be difficult, demanding. It is outdoor recreation where there's days where it's, especially in Texas, 2 billion degrees. <laughs> and there's other days, as Andrew talked about, that it's, you know, 30 degrees and, and cold. But you know what? We're, we're all doing it and enjoying it together. So it, it really is a lifestyle. It is making sure that we have the fine lifestyle balance of taking care of our family and our friends, but also taking care of our park family and friends. Because as you know, uh, we are a city in ourselves, and things happen all the time. The business never stops. Our guests' enjoyment and demands never stop. So it's making sure that we can take care of all those needs in real time as, as quick as we can. And in many ways, that's what makes working for Six Flags, especially now, so exciting is the commitment to the guest experience, the guest-centric nature that Salim himself has to make sure that, oh my gosh, Make the parks beautiful. He was in our park just the other day and we were talking about palm trees and he looks at me and he goes, oh my gosh, buy big, buy big palm trees. It's like, great. You don't, have to, you don't have to ask me twice as we're redoing our water park to buy more palm trees. So truly last week, we put in 27 new palm trees in our water park to make it more thematic, to make it more lush landscape because there's an, it creates an emotional experience. And this upcoming week, we're, we're having a next round of big palm trees that will be installed along with all the theming and painting and storytelling and benches and shade and all the other innovations that we're introducing as a company this year and for our future. You know, you mentioned Jeff Salim there. I want to mention to you because I, I, it just resonates with what you said. Uh, I've not met Salim, but I have a couple of uh, Thuzi friends of mine, very close to Thuzi friends of mine that um, I think it may have even been at your park. It was, it was at one of the Six Flags parks in Texas, but it might've been your park. 
and they met him. He was walking the park and, 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 and they talked to him for quite a few minutes. And you know, I think he, they said something about that. He appreciated that they were Thuzies and he wanted to talk to them. And what my friend said is they said, Salim gets it. And that was, that really struck me. And what you just mentioned there, you talked about the palm trees. Salim's like, you don't have to ask me twice, get him. So it really sounds like he wants to make things happen in a good way. And he wants to help the part. He's not just looking at the bottom line. He's not just looking at, you know, trying to make more money or he wants to improve the experience. Would you say that's the case? It, it absolutely is. I mean, the guest centric nature that he has and the passion for taking care of our guests is, is unsurpassed. When I'm walking around the park with Celine, it is not unusual that we'll just sit down at a table and talk with guests for not just, Oh, how are you one minute? I mean, it's meaningful conversations about what do you like? What do you not like? You know, are you here? Yes. And so for example, the last time she was here, we talked with a mom that was working on her laptop. She was by herself working. The kids were in the park and we just sat for probably 20 minutes to 30 minutes talking about her. And from that, the idea of a nicer VIP lounge space, you know, was created and we're getting ready to open a really wow. cool concierge feeling VIP lounge, uh, Coca-Cola VIP lounge in a, in a few weeks. But wow. just yes, and calling guests and walking around the park and, and saying, oh my gosh, you know, do you believe you need more benches? Absolutely, we do. Do you need more trash cans? Yes, sir. We absolutely do. So this year alone, um, because of his really guest centric support, we've ordered 800 pieces of new furniture that are beginning to arrive, new tables, new chairs, new umbrellas, new shade, new lounge chairs. And again, what's great is it's not it's not cheap furniture. It's let's get the nice furniture. Let's get lounge chairs for our water park that are actually the cloth, fabric, comfortable lounge chairs. Get them where they're yeah. themed and get so our benches that we rolled out last year with kind of the first wave they're beautifully themed steampunk benches they're very comfortable they're very durable and so we're ordering two new themed areas worth of new benches this year hundreds of more trash cans which as you guys know the more trash cans you have in the park the more likely you guess your guests are to put something in the receptacle which just makes the park cleaner Mm -hmm. plus umbrellas and shade and just tons of other amenities that we're adding that you know i'm sure you guys have seen as well but to have that level of guest centric of Hey, let's do it. Let's do it right. Let's do it big. And let's do it where our guests see it. Let's make it where it's noticeable to our guests. So we've, from repainting and redecoring and adding new statues and monuments and creating custom turtle sculptures that are going in our water park, these are all great things that we as fans, we love it. We love that our parks look unique and are different and have great amenities. And when I'm buying food, there's a place to sit. I don't want to stand in a trash can and eat off a lid which I've been to parks and that was the option. If we bought food, it's like, oh my gosh, there's no tables. We put our food on top of a trash can. Like we know we can do better than that. We want to do better than that. It's fun to have that level of support to really make our parks exceptional places for our guests to come and enjoy. That's fantastic. Wow. Nice. An overall theme that I'm getting that's resonating with me very strongly from your attitude that I absolutely love is the... Theory of always chasing the carrot. I connect that (laughs) personally and professionally to my life. You know, I share with you the fact that I'm a teacher, my fitness journey, you know, just always seeing how I can improve. And I'm looking at myself, you know, not I talked about my fitness journey earlier, but, you know, professionally, I see a lot of teachers at my stage in the game that are just the burnout, they're, they're done. They're ready to retire. And every student in their classroom, just like your staff, you know, your guests, they're miserable right along with them. And um, so it again comes back to that leadership, you know, what can I do to constantly improve? And, you know, a lot of my, a lot of teachers, like I said, at my stage in the game, they're just waiting their days out. And people are asking me, you know, regularly, like, when are you going to retire? I could technically retire in three more years. Like, my work's not done yet. When I feel like there's no more to learn, you know, no further that I can go with this, no other ways to improve, then I'll know when my work is finished. But, and I think, too, that is what keeps people coming to your park, wanting to work at your park, wanting to visit your park is knowing each time you return, the bar is going to be raised yet again. 
thank you, Kim. I mean, you're, you're exactly correct. It really is that philosophical belief that tomorrow will be better than today. Yes. And, and surrounding yourself with other folks that also believe that, that it is our job to make sure that tomorrow is better than today. Mm -hmm. And it is disappointing when you work and come across in your journey, folks, that for lack of other terms, as you described, they're working, but really they were tired years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, these, especially in, in teaching and what we do, these positions yeah. are sacred. And we just cannot have people that just fill it and are going with the motions. It's like, oh my gosh, we need someone that's going to continue to drive and teach and coach and make us better tomorrow, better operators, take care of our guests, take care of our team. We, we have to have that just hardwired passion to make sure that tomorrow is indeed going to be better than today. Yeah. And, you know, everybody has a bad day once in a while. It's looking at those bad days and going, OK, what went wrong? What can we do differently tomorrow yep. to change mm -hmm. that? So you, you don't right. get stuck in that downward spiral. And then what I refer to as teaching like a dinosaur. Can't <laughs> let the, <laughs> referencing Velocicoaster. You can't let that. You, you can't let that happen. Otherwise, <laughs> it's like you said, you, you, you left years ago. Your body's just there, but your soul's not there. And it's, it's toxic. It's not helping anybody around you. So you've talked about the impact that you aim to have on your staff, on your guests, how that's affected your life and the, the impact that you aim to have on their lives as well. When people leave at the end of their journey, you know, when the guest leaves for the day, or maybe when one of your staff members is moving on to another position at another park or another profession, what's the one thing you would like them to take away from your, their experience with you? Hopefully it is a positive leadership style. It's that as we lead and as we grow in our careers, both professionally or in our personal life is to make sure that the glass is always half full. We have to remain positive in our leadership style. And it really is the mantra of do good, be kind, and have fun. And you do those three things as you leave our walls and move on. No doubt you will have a successful life and a successful journey. It is absolutely thrilling for myself and our leadership to see the next young leaders taking our positions or taking positions within our competitors. I mean, it, it, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And it's also sharing with the younger leaders that you should be looking for new opportunities. That's the whole point of this. The whole point of our time together is that you are getting more skills, becoming better rounded for your next opportunity. And we've had many folks that have gone and worked for destination parks or other regional theme parks. And to me, that's extremely flattering knowing that, hey, what we are doing here is is viewed as right. And what we're doing is viewing and growing the next generation of leaders for the industry, because it has to be better than we have it today. And what better way than to give those skills to our up and coming leaders to make sure that they're ready and set up for their ongoing success, but to do it in a positive way, to always coach up, but to be good, be kind and have fun. So I mentioned this earlier, Jeff, you know, Susie's, I mentioned how I feel about Fiesta Texas versus the other parks in China. I've been to them, not all of them, but most of them. But, you know, a lot of other Thusies, friends of mine and, and whatnot, look at Fiesta Texas as being the best park in the chain. Now, if we analyze it, it's not the biggest Six Flags park, not by far. And it doesn't have the biggest coaster collection. You know, again, it's, it's smaller, so it's going to have a smaller coaster collection by nature. What do you think it is? And again, I, I you gotta extrapolate a little bit because you know, you know, can't go into the minds of all these hundreds of enthusiasts that feel this way. What would you guess it is? Because, you know, just to kind of give a little more background, if you think about it, look at the things you're doing with like Dr. Diabolical and Poltergeist and you know, the theming. Theming normally isn't a big aspect of a regional park, certainly, especially Six Flags. The Six Flags is, is more of a value chain. You know, and, and more for just about the high thrills without much theming. And, you know, you talk about all these things, these this attention to detail that, you know, these theme benches and all that, that's not Six Flags. So 
So is it that kind of like how certain cities are test markets for like, you know, McDonald's and other restaurant chains? You know, is it something like that where, where Fiesta Texas is at a different level than the other Six Flags parks? Or is it you, uh, is it you're not fighting for your park, but just because of how much you care that you're asked, you're, you're getting what you asked for because you care? You know, what is it that is making Fiesta Texas so special? It's one, it's I'm surrounded by lovely people that are also have a passion for theme parks that we love it. We love it's it's we have assembled. In working with our senior leadership team and our company, we, when we are looking at our destiny and controlling our own destiny, we really strive to make our park a well-rounded experience where you're absolutely right. We don't have the largest, biggest coasters. We don't have the highest quantity of coasters, but we really go out of our way from our local planning to make sure that we have a very well-rounded collection of experiences and we offer really good attention to detail and empowering the team that everyone can do that. Everyone can update and modify signage and add theming and add storytelling. And all of a sudden, when you have an entire culture at a park level of everyone looking at, oh, you know, all the flowers associated with Joker should be purple or green. Then that just exposes <laughs> more level of detail and, and passion in the experience. But it is making sure that we've got rides for everybody. And that's another great example of in working with Salim and our senior leadership is their commitment to multi-generational experiences. The fact that we're adding mm. this year, I mean, you just look at what we're doing this year at Fiesta Texas and the fact that we love and embrace, you know, what we're doing to take care of our guests. You know, we have, we have planned and asked for and have worked towards our new Coca-Cola VIP lounge, our brand new E6 esports gaming facility, which as far as we know is the first of its kind at any theme park on planet mm. earth. The fact that we're getting a brand new, first of its kind, multi-generational kids coaster with Kid Flash, the first single rail coaster dueling racing with the Aurora Light Package, first of its kind. We've, we're in the process of repainting our entire kids area. The water park is all being rebranded to Hurricane Harbor. We're adding seven new kid slides, again, multi-generational versions of our bigger slides. So kids that want to eventually ride a big tornado attraction. Well, we're building a small tornado attraction that mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, every age can ride the small tornado. And then they get a little bit older. Now they can ride the big tornado and other slides like that. All new theming, all new storytelling, all new paint in the water park, painting all the slides, adding the new landscaping, writing a brand new go-kart experience this year, which is also more of a game. Right? It's more of like riding in a video game that when you're driving the track and these new electric cars, you're collecting points, you're collecting coins, you're racing against each other. You've got a booster feature to pass other folks. You can change in your coins to get other boosters. You hit an oil slick, your car comes to a screeching stop, everyone passes you. It's it's a much more immersive, multi-generational experience in addition to the 800 pieces of new furniture, all the new landscape we are putting in, the fact that we're painting and scrubbing and cleaning light poles and rails and I mean, you name it, it's just that broad nature of the experience that all those touch points add up. All those small details create a much larger picture of critical mass that it just makes you feel good. And what I love about our enthusiasts, they can actually clearly articulate in our language that, but for our general guests, the greatest satisfier that we have is like, oh my gosh, the park looks great. Your park was so clean. The restrooms look good. The restrooms smell good. It's all those small attention to detail, as you know, that just at the end of the day, like that was just fun. It was effortless. All the friction points are gone. You were able to get in nice and fast and quick and easy. And the way we open our gates and modify the park and make sure that from the time you arrive on property to the time you go in, there's no waiting for security. There's no waiting to actually get it through the turnstile. It's all those things that just make it, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to do it again because it was fun. Wow. I mean, I had no idea half the things that you guys are doing this year. I had not heard about those. That's, that's crazy how much you're doing. I, I, Wow. I just, all I got to say is keep it up and you're just getting me more, more and more excited to come back there for my next <laughs> visit. So, but, yeah. You couple, you couple all that with our new events. I mean, throughout the entire year, we're adding new flavors of the world food festival. Right now we're doing Viva La Fiesta, which is a big San Antonio event with entertainment and fireworks. And if you haven't seen our 360 fireworks, you know, go to YouTube and watch our 4th of July or New Year's Eve fireworks where the entire quarry wall is lit up in fireworks from, Wonder Woman all the way to the Iron Rattler. We're blasting the entire quarry wall. And it's all those types of events and multi-generational mm. experiences that hopefully will just continue to make Six Flags Fiesta Texas a really great place to, to work and play. 
Great. You were talking about those details. One of the things that really jumped out at me that stood out from my experience as a guest you were talking about, you know, not having to wait in the line, you know, the lines moving. One of the highlights of our trip was the team over at Iron Rattler. I mean, I love Iron Rattler. It is the most unique RMC I've been on. I've been on 13 RMCs so far. And that one just really <laughs> struck a chord with me. But what was absolutely fantastic, I mean, not just at Iron Rattler, but going around the park the operations there were just incredible and iron rattler we literally were able to sit on the train they had operations moving so fast they would let us switch out rows i mean as many times in a row as we wanted to ride and i mean that they're happy to do it and they, they even at the end of the night they knew that i was on a road trip you know from had traveled a long way to get there they took the time to let us take pictures of the train, take pictures with the train before we left, have a conversation wow. with us, and um, just made it a very meaningful, memorable experience all the way around. It was one of the highlights of my sure. summer travels last year. And, and thank you for sharing that because it just goes to the commitment of hiring lovely people and working with lovely people. And Iron Rattler is another great example. We now own three trains for that ride. So two trains year round can be in circulation. Our boomerang Fantastic. right now is actually currently down for a complete obsolescent redo with two new state-of-the-art Vacoma trains, all new magnetic brakes, all new control system, all new structural enhancements that that ride will feel brand new again when it opens here in just a few weeks. And then after that, our Wonder Woman attraction will actually be going down for a major renovation improvement later this summer, which will feature the second generation train design, along with also all new controls and enhancements to really make that ride feel more exciting and smoother and more dynamic than even when it opened. So to have these types of levels of investments to really just make the rides, everyone work hard for us, everyone to be spectacular and everyone to, as you said, when you get off Iron Rattler, it's like, oh my gosh. The, the trains are great. The ride profile is great. The mm -hmm. team is great. It just, it just makes the whole experience that much more magical and world-class. And I'll tell you what really stood yeah. out. You know, a lot of parks at the end of the day, when you do those last train rides, they're just, they're just, they're, they all want to go home. <laughs> they're just, you know, they're rushing you out of there. I mean, they actually stopped. They were asking me questions. They wanted to talk to me. I mean, it was like there was an actual... Genuine interest in talking to me as a person, you know, not just hurry up and get out of here. It's a hundred degrees. I want to go home. And that's just not an experience you get at every park. Yeah. No. Yeah. Jeff, you mentioned that your boomerang is getting some uh, for, for updates. You mentioned the new trains uh, or new train. Is it getting the vest restraints as well? It is. So it is going to the latest and greatest. Yay. So the rider is going to open at it is the most ridden and loved on boomerang in the six flag system by far. And Andrew, we actually bought two trains. We bought two trains for our boomerang, both brand new state of the art. Spare. So this way, unlike before, where when we were doing our six to eight week maintenance downtime, the ride was dark. Now we, the ride will always be in circulation for our guests. So to add more ride capacity, which again has been great. To, so we've been able to do that in Boomerang. Iron Rattler has another train. When we ordered Cliffhanger, we bought Cliffhanger with four trains. So this way it can run three trains year round. And now doing that, I mean, these are things that traditionally you would not expect from Six Flags. These are things that really are no, new. No, not all. For the quality of innovation and to keep the big toys running in very high fashion, um, which is great. And the ride, the, the new trains look sleek. They're spectacular. The vest restraints are comfortable. The new mag brakes i mean the, our maintenance team is cheering over the mag brakes because we like a pit crew had to spend lots of time and energy calibrating replacing the brakes the old friction brakes because of the wear and tear on them when a train is coming in at 40 miles an hour backwards as you can imagine there's <laughs> a lot of things are grabbing now that just goes away because nothing ever touches they're all magnetic brakes our operations team with the whole new control system it's going to save us we're going to be able to give more riders per guest. It's going to be a more comfortable, enjoyable, thrilling ride. It's going to have a broader appeal because of the vest restraint. Our maintenance costs are going to go down on the ride. The uptime is going to go up on the ride. 
our, our operations team is going to love it because of just we're able to continue to check fast and get high capacity and just other innovations. The old control system, if a prox switch went bad, it just basically said, oh, yeah, you got a problem. Go figure it out because it was an old. <laughs> so our maintenance team would be like, I, maybe let's check this prox. So let's go over here and check this <laughs> prox. The new system says, hey, you know what? It's that prox that is bad. So instead of spending and trying to troubleshoot and figure out yes, now the system actually says, hey, this is where your problem is. Go change that prox, reset, you're good to go. So just, again, more uptime, more rides per guest, more guest comfort. You, you really see that throughout the whole park. And the boomerang is just another great example of that innovation. So, Jeff, I have to ask, because I, I know to some degree the Six Flags Parks are treated kind of as individual business units, you know, like, you're, you know, you're a park president of that one park and you're talking about all these things, you know, all, you know, I'm not going to rename them all, but there's so many things you mentioned here today, the e-gaming, the benches, the go-karts, the, you know, the, the upgrades to these rides that all costs money. So is it that the quality of your experience that you're giving to your guests, does that then, with, you know, with this extra money spent, does that then translate into a, a higher level revenue at your park? Well, as you can imagine, the goal of any capital reinvestment or expense reinvestment is that, is that yeah. the expectation is that you return on investment. You give good ROI, which in our case means more attendance, more revenue. And then it becomes right. the self-fulfilling prophecy that once you deliver and you generate more revenue, like any business, it's like, oh my gosh, you want to spend money with great teams people that can deliver the ROI and deliver the quality of execution. And in many ways, any business, that's the secret yeah. sauce. You want to invest in people that you think are going to do all those things to drive the culture, the experience, the revenue, the bottom line, the performance, all forward. And you want to continue to, to reinvest in those rock stars and those folks that are going to perform and get the results that the company or organization needs. Yeah, well, I'm, and I'm not going to name names here, but... Uh, so there's a certain park I can think of, or even a chain I can think of that in the present climate, present time is doing a lot where they're doing cost cutting or raising prices, but not necessarily increasing the quality of experience. So given that my familiarity with that and not naming the park, but seeing what you guys are doing there, Fiesta, Texas, that is an absolute breath of fresh air because it's doing the opposite. It's not cutting back, it's investing more, but because you see the big picture, and yeah, I understand the macroeconomics of it. You know, I, I, I'm familiar with this. I work in sales for a company and so forth. By, off, by, by providing a better experience, your, your customers are going to come back and they're going to, if they're having a, a better, if I'm having a better day somewhere, I'm more likely to spend money. I'm more likely to, to want to commemorate my visit and buy a souvenir. And, and you know, if, if people are having a bad day, the last thing they want to do is spend more money. So you, what you guys are doing, keep doing it. And I wish, again, not naming names, but the, some of these other parks that don't get that, I, I really hope they wake up. And hopefully maybe you guys will help wake them up. And again, raise the bar, like you were talking about earlier, for the competitors, where everyone, what Universal's done, Universal's raised the bar for all of the parks. And here we have, you know, what you guys are doing in Fiesta, Texas, maybe some of that theming you're doing. Maybe you wouldn't be doing that if it weren't for Harry Potter, you know, years ago. You know, the dominoes fall in certain ways. So, again, by, by, one, by one entity raising the bar, it increases competition and encourages others. So, again, hopefully, you know, you guys keep doing what you're doing and hopefully that helps other parks too. Well, and the, the great news, this is exactly what the company vision is. What we are doing is exactly what our senior leadership team is wanting the high tide lifts all ships. It is these strategic reinvestments of making our parks a premium experience. Salim asked us to create parks that are beautiful, make them look more destination-like. And again, when he has these conversations with myself and our team, we're like, absolutely, yes. We will gladly <laughs> move the needle and create really fantastic properties that then do just exactly what you said, Andrew. We, we know that if you're having a great time, you're going to spend more money. You're going to want to come back. You're going to want to buy a season pass. You're going to want to, where you maybe thought you're only going to come once in the year. You're like, oh my gosh, all these festivals that they're doing, all these special events and the fireworks right. and the show, the entertainment. And oh my gosh, they've got go-karts and rides. And I mean, it's just, it becomes such a great critical mass. Like, my gosh, we, we just plan on coming like six to eight times. So let's just buy a season pass and, <laughs> and have fun all summer long. So oh. it, it, it's great to see the trajectory 
that Six Flags is really headed, specifically with the vision that Celine has of really creating destination and premium quality experiences from the flowers and landscaping to restrooms to connections to become the friendliest park chain. I mean, these are all great things to keep our North Star trajectory in the right place, which is just being the best we can. And that kind of goes full circle with when we're in our meetings, the direction that we always end with is just make it great. As long as we're making it great, everything else will come. That's outstanding. And you bring up a good point. It, it's exciting to see what, what you guys leading the, the charge there, what it's going to do for the other Six Flags parks. You guys, you know, trying out different things, seeing success of things, and that translating into improvements at other Six Flags parks. As a Six Flags membership holder, uh, I'm excited for that. That's fantastic. We, we love innovation, no doubt, but truly, as we all explore these key learnings throughout the entire system of parks, it really is the high tide lifts all ships, sharing the best practices, just keeping us all moving forward extremely fast and agile. So not a day goes by that there's not some level of improvement going on somewhere for sure that hopefully our guests take notice and like, wow, you know, that looks that looks really nice that I came in today and oh my gosh, every single rail in the park is now painted and I came back the next weekend and there's flowers in every single new bed or there's new pots or we even have mosaic frogs in some of our trees in Los Festivales and the extra attention to detail and theming that when you do come back to the parks, you'll be surprised with what you view as familiar. And that really is a great compliment that you will still be genuinely surprised with the familiarity of, of what you're seeing. I think what you're doing for Six Flags Fiesta Texas is really paving the path for the future. Because, you know, as Thuzies, a lot of the conversations are always, you know, around what are the new biggest, best, you know, record-breaking, most thrilling coasters going to be. But in reality, if you want your park to grow, withstand, you know, changes over time you have to attract different audiences of all ages and stages and appeal to everyone and that is exactly you've hit the nail on the head with what fiesta texas is doing so just keep doing what you're doing because i mean as an enthusiast i'm already wanting to return but this is you know families that want to go with young kids, older people, you know, people that just want to go enjoy being in a park. It's a place that everyone's going to want to go. And like Andrew said, I just really hope that this travels throughout the entire Six Flags chain because you all have definitely got a great thing going. Well, it is that multi-generational commitment, no doubt. The fact that we sometimes forget as thrill seekers and fans that our new kid flash for our younger guests is their version of King to Ka. Yes. That, that is a big, super thrilling, most exciting attraction. And any parent knows the pure joy is taking your child on a ride and watching the joy through their eyes. Very similar to what Andrew was talking about with going to parks you know, with fellow first timers that you are their guide and you get to see, you get to relive the newness of yeah, the experience yeah. through their yeah. eyes. Absolutely. And, and that is exactly what we try to do on a daily basis. And, but sometimes as enthusiasts, we forget that not everybody wants to go on King to come. Mm -hmm. Not right. everybody wants to go 250 miles an hour, but you know what? A train ride through a tunnel and waterfalls could be just as thrilling as Kid Flash, as our airplane rides, as drop towers, that it's all relative. The thrill scale is relative. And where we can fall or lose our focus is when we forget that thrills are different for everybody. So that's why shows are important. Entertainment is important because for some folks, a live entertainment production yes. is as yes. enjoyable and as thrilling as a 120 mile hour launch is for us. Yes. Absolutely. Yes riding our gully washer, our Raging River Rapids ride. And that's why our our log flumes, all of our rides, we've kept them all, we've loved on them all, we've created very broad, well-rounded experiences because those are thrilling for large majorities of our guests. And we've made sure that, kind of to Andrew's point, we've kept a very well-rounded experience so that there is thrills for all ages, thrills for all skill set, thrills for all lifestyles. It is that really rejuvenated focus 
of a multi-generational experience. And just with the things I mentioned, you could see how we are, regardless of who you are, hopefully we're <laughs> creating a new experience this year. They're like, oh my gosh, esports, I love video games. And I don't know if you've seen the renderings of our new esports facility that opens in a few yeah, weeks. But it is, it is, again, it's thematic. It's visually stunning. Even if you yes. don't want to play games, you can go grab, I know this was pricey, but there's a bar inside. You can go grab your favorite adult beverage. We've got wireless mm. charging stations in there. You can just enjoy the feeling and the air conditioning. Directly above it is the Coke VIP lounge, where, again, if you want to get a specialty sandwich, if you're a Diamond member, you have free access to it. But you just want to chill, relax. We've got our wait times up there, so you can actually see the ride wait times. We're in the Coke VIP lounge. It also has its own full service nice. bar, its own restrooms, really creating these high-quality spaces that traditionally regional theme parks haven't. And it's really exciting to be in the forefront of this innovation for our guests and really for our fans. You know, That's and awesome. it's, it's something it. enthusiasts really need to think about too is you've got to keep the little people wanting to come back. You've got to keep the families wanting to come back. Absolutely. If, if you want to keep being able to build the big stuff, yep. the people have to keep coming to the park and building the capital to make that possible. And you all are doing it. <laughs> and you're <laughs> All the radar job, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> at this point in time, with really reaching across all ages and stages, every interest when it comes to coming to a theme park, making it totally immersive for anyone that walks through the gates. Which, which is really fun to be a part of. And there's no doubt when I look at the summer of Kid Flash, I'm sure there's going to be lots of big kids on there. Uh, just because the nature of the ride experience is just going to be cool regardless mm -hmm. of who you are. But oh, it is. I'll be, I'll be one of those big kids when I get back to the park. But, but you're absolutely right. It is. It's the fact that we get excited to paint light poles, that we get excited <laughs> to create new landscapes around the park, to take what used to just be grass and now it's a beautiful flower bed and making sure our waterfalls are all working and adding lights to the park and adding all kinds of other features and excitement and, and decor. And just at the end of the day, as you know, we just want to feel good. As human beings, we just want to feel loved and feel good. And yeah. we have a unique opportunity by creating theme parks to do just that in our space, that you come in and you feel loved and you feel appreciated and valued. And you're part of this much larger experience that hopefully just makes you feel good. And at the end of the day, that's, that's pure magic. And, you know, looking back yeah. on our visit to the park, my son and I, we're, we're diehard coaster enthusiasts. We'll ride all day, <laughs> but my daughter, now she's an enthusiast, she'll ride, but she's also one that really just likes to take a step back and immerse herself in the park as well. You mentioned the waterfall. One of the highlights of her trip was just sitting in front of that waterfall and, you know, just a complete peace and contentment and just enjoying be being there. And, you know, yeah. you just you never know for that person that just wants to come sit and, and enjoy the landscaping. That's correct. So our next question, I want to kind of explain the context of it. So you have a background of where it's coming from. We refer to it as kind of the dusty question. We've just added it to our platform of questions this season there was a young man named dusty that was a guest and a fan of the podcast before i joined i think back during season one he was also very involved with coaster kids and he was a personal friend of our executive producer david's he unexpectedly passed away last year at the age of 16 so Kind of looking back, you know, on his life, it really made us all just reflect, you know, on the word legacy, you know, and what that means to us as individuals. Thinking about your legacy, how would you like your family, friends, and colleagues to remember your life? once your days on this earth have passed? If I could sum it up, it would be that I would be remembered for just truly loving people. That says it very well. There's nothing else that matters at the end of the day. There's nothing else that matters more than the human experience, 
and loving on people. And that's one of the things that drew me to working in theme parks from an entertainment standpoint. The fact that we are actually inviting folks, not just for 30 minutes or an hour, that this is a place that you will be spending all day with your family and friends and creating memories about being each other. What is we've talked about, yes, you'll remember the rides and the rides are the, the uniting force, but it's really the collection of emotional experiences that really make what we do so special. And at the end of the day, if there's one thing that hopefully is remembered long ago, besides my crazy videos and, and podcasts like this, it's just that, you know what, we, he really loved people and helped grow people, groom people, train people, and have a lot of fun along the way. Thank you so much for sharing. Every time we've asked that question, the response has been different. And that is yet again, the first time that response has been given, but I totally resonate with that so strongly. Do as much good as you can for as long as you can for as many as you can. Those are the words I tend to live by each day. Now, a lot of our audience that listens to our podcast, they listen for inspiration. You know, they listen for advice. You know, our podcast is about theme park therapy. So a lot of our listeners are looking for help, you know, in different areas of their life, be it fear facing or a personal struggle. Let's talk about advice. And this can be advice, you know, about fear facing parks or just life in general. If you have one piece of advice you could give to our audience, what is it that you would like to offer? It would be truly try to enjoy life every day. It is a precious gift that goes by very fast. And the most precious commodity we have for each other is, the, is, is time. Spend time with your friends, spend time with people that lift you up and minimize the time of the opposite. Do not waste your time and energy on folks that aren't there to lift you up, to raise you and that have got you. Life is too short, too sweet to be surrounded by negativity, negative energy, and just folks that bring you down. Just make sure that you're surrounding yourself with other lovable people that truly are there with you and for you and are your biggest cheerleaders in life. And you will have a happy journey along the way. Great advice. And, and to that, <laughs> I could speak to that on a multitude of levels. That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast. We can it is. Podcast. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, Jolly teachers, <laughs> there are a lot of times I'll get frowns from teachers at other schools when I talk to them and you know, they're complainers. And the first thing, the first thing I, I stop before it even passes go is, is, is complaining and negativity. That's not going to build anyone up. All it's going to do is tear you down. And, you know, the whole support thing, if, and I, I discovered this, you know, too, through my fitness journey. And as I was, as I was starting to become, more successful with you know just life in general if people are there to knock you down they've got to take care of that themselves that's not your issue that's an issue that only they can fix but in the meantime they have to be moved out of the circle so you can continue to focus on that level of self-improvement for sure so advice well given thank you my pleasure the final question that we always like to ask, and this is mainly for our audience, is people that would like to learn more about you, you know, reach out, make contact, people that have been inspired by your interview in some way. Where is our audience able to find you on social media? Well, there's a whole variety of places they can hunt me down. <laughs> <laughs> Dig the needle out of the haystack. Obviously, uh, there's there's the park social media channels. Uh, there's also my email address is actually available on our website. If you go to the Six Flags website, you'll actually see my email address is on there. I do have uh, Twitter. You can Jeffrey Siebert at, at Twitter, also Instagram. And I do post quite regularly on our fan sites. 
I do share lots of content and information with Thrill Seekers United, the American Coaster Enthusiasts, and Amusement Source are areas that I constantly share in, in, information and in, in what is going on. But if you want to come see me in person, which of course is what I would love to see everybody, just as a reminder, our big enthusiast event is yet to come in June called Roller Coaster Rodeo. And it is truly an enthusiast event for enthusiasts including full park ERT at night where every single ride in the entire park is open for our guests, dark after dark rides on the train, every themed area, every ride, tons of food, tons of fun, behind the scenes tours, walks up our coaster, catwalks, stairwells. I mean, you name it. It is truly an enthusiast event for enthusiasts. And so if you want to come say hi in person, Myself and our leadership team is intimately involved, and they're quite often and very accessible uh, during the event, including Q and A's, meet and greets, dinners, you name it. We're all here together to celebrate again all of us and our passion and joys for theme parks, rides, attractions, but most importantly, friendship. All right. Well, that wraps up all the questions we have for you today. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and be our guest. This has been a joy and a privilege, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely my pleasure. Look forward to seeing you guys around the park. Again, my final words of wisdom, do good, be kind, and have fun. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. If you want to see more of us, we upload every Friday. Be sure to like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, all at Coaster Challenge. Links are in the description below. Thanks for joining us here today.